So thanks everybody for joining, and of course, thank you, Martin, for doing this once again with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> totally. So uh, Martin was so kind enough uh, to share the work that he's done for Tender Bar uh, in prepping it, and uh, he chose the photographer Eggleston, so we're going to do a little bit of a master class of Eggleston today from the view of Martin <laughs> looking at the pictures. So that's what we're going to start off with and jump right in. Your grandfather is a selfish old prick who resents taking care of his family. And yet, you all end up back here at my house. Welcome. Amazing. Your only uncle, so I'm also your favorite uncle, right? It sounds like something. Maybe. Like <laughs> I have no idea how, but you are going to law school. So you can sue your father for child support. No, so he can help with your fines about the septic tank. No, here we go. Come on, Mary. Hey, whose kid is that? My sister. Which sister? The hot one or the crazy one? What, you wanna die? <laughs> okay, two rules. I'm never gonna let you in. And I'm gonna always tell you the truth. Your father is a deadbeat. I'll take care of you. Teach you the male sciences. I saw you in the yard playing sports. You're not very good. Now find some other activities. I like to read. You read enough of those? Maybe. You could become a writer. One more thing, very important. Never hit a woman. Even if she stabs you with scissors. Got it. See you, me and Julio down by the schoolyard. Got an announcement. Today, my nephew is officially a man. <laughs> it is a great pleasure to offer you a place in the Yale class of 1986. Hey, I'm JR. Sydney, you're in my class. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm on my way. So what do you want to be, JR? I'm going to be a writer. Well, what's your main theme? The absent father. The poor boy who wants a rich girl. She doesn't love you. What you do next is going to be important. Would you go and stare up at the building in the rain? Baby! No. Well, I'm on my way. I don't know where I'm going, and I'm on my way. What are you going to do without the bad guy in your life? In life, you got to have it. If you don't have it, you never get it. And I say you got it. Um, do you maybe just want to set it up, the movie, in what time period it plays, why you got, took Eggleston as a, yeah. as a reference? So, so The Tender Bar is a coming-of-age story. It's a memoir um, based on J.R. Moringer's book called um, The Tender Bar. Um, what a surprise. <laughs> and um, it's, it's about a little boy. It's a coming-of-age story and um, uh, takes place in Long Island, 70s and 80s. And when we started talking about it with, the, with George and the production, uh, very often we go to stills pictures, um, to photographers um, who inform us or who give us an inspiration or a feel, sometimes a texture or something. And William Eggleston came up um, and, and I showed those pictures to George and he loved them for the grain, for the texture, for the light, for the contrast and all of that. He did a lot of 50s and 60s photography and he doesn't do anything glamorous. It's very often available light. It's, um, he does a lot of Kodak chromes. He, extremely beautiful, but also very simple pictures. And he went to places um, all over America and then portrayed normal life. So um, it's very beautiful in composition. It's very beautiful in, in lighting, and it's, very spe it's a very special look at, at, uh, at people. Yeah, so we'll just maybe go through it, and then we can have a look at it. Yeah. Um, it's always a starting point, because you never know what you run into, but, but it opens discussions. It's not like you're trying to copy that. It's not like you you know, if anything, what I'm looking for is a feeling on which you base what you what you're deciding, and then for me it's more like if you know that if you have um, you know then I think 
it informs your decisions, but it's not really, like I said, it, I'm, it's not technical, it's not like I'm copying this, and then it's not I'm trying to use the same film stock or something like that. Yeah, so it's it basically your vision is based upon the feeling that you're trying to create for yourself and that you're taking on now. Do you share these images with the gaffer or people you work with? I share this, um, initially I, I showed this to George and then, you know, see if it's something which he responds to or, you know, maybe he hates it and um, sometimes we also, George knows so many films so, so it's very easy, he comes up with references like Dog Day Afternoon or something like that and then I go in to look into that and, and you know, um, it's, 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 it's a base for discussion. I share this first with the with the production designer and with the director. And then based on that, we start talking and then, you know, later, because the gaffer usually comes much later into the process. Do you late in the process share these images on when you had a feeling that's the way the film's gonna be? Or is it that point when you figured it out, when you're talking with the gaffer, is it more the, just the technical part to figure out then? No, I, I, I like with, what I like with gaffers is that when they, um, if, they if, if it's really bad gaffers, then you start talking technical, then you start put this light here, put this diffusion and, and cut it like that or something. But um, if, if you have good gaffers, then you say, okay, I want to wash here, I want that, and I want this, and, we, and then, you know, maybe if there's a problem, you talk about this could be that source. Or I like you know, you tell them what you like usually, and then if they respond, um, then it's it's it becomes an organic process. And then also, I like when uh, I've done films all over the place, and then I've done five films with the same gaffer, but then I also use very different different gaffers in different places, and I like that because sometimes you learn something you didn't expect, or you know, uh, certain things are not available in certain areas, and then you go like, hmm, what could we do? And then you know ideas come up and you go like, I n would have never thought about that. Mm -hmm. And I like to take that on board. So, um, yeah, I show, I show gaffers what I've, mm. you know, that uh, Franz Wetterferings, our gaffer in, on Tenerbar, has seen those and, and he was familiar with this. Um, you know, I so show this also to the colorist of the film and then um, maybe camera test later or some stills and then we, I try to if you have enough time to do that, and if you know more or less where you're going and what you're doing, it's nice to get then a lot from the pe person who grades it. Because uh, you know, good DITs might be able to do it, but I always feel like um, it's hard to do that on top of the, all the data management. I don't do live grading on set. I, don't, I, I never have the time to do that because I always operate myself and I love doing that. So I try to get it in a shape that when we're on set, we know the direction, we have a lot, and, and we can then modify or something like that. Mm. Mm. So you set up a lot ahead of time, knowing where you're gonna go, and then you just mm. go with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, have something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do you do different lots for day and for night? So do they do different things you set up, or you just do one lot for the movie? Oh, that depends on the movie, okay. and that depends on what you're doing. Usually I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't do a different lot for night, very often because usually I try to do one lot and then within that world I change colors on lights, I, I do different lighting maybe for night but, but I don't want to do uh, you know a different lot for night, it's, it's, I don't know, sometimes feels like you're doing two different languages and there might be a reason for it if, if the story asks for it, if it's a time difference but I don't do day night different, no usually not. Interesting, when you look at this image there's a lot of green going on and how the face comes out. W was it for the color that you were interested in or just the way the focus was of the light? I love how the light closes in on the face of the boy and how everything fades away. The color doesn't really matter so much. It would be beautiful in black and white, uh, you know, but um, it was not a color reference. It was more like a, um, like a mood and then how li how his expression and the light come together and then you know it's uh, there's a beauty to it which I really love and in intimacy although it's like a spotlight on the face it's beautiful with shadows too no or is it a feeling that Eggleston in terms of composition 
It was always interesting what he did. Yeah, I, I love that he puts people in places. And, and quite often people are, I don't know, there's a melan melancholy to his pictures a lot, but um, it, it's um, a sense of loneliness, but it's so strong in the, in the shapes, and then there's not much color there. I, 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 you know. Again, I think it's more something where if you take this kind of photography on board, then that will be something you have to put yourself in places and then be open to whatever happens there. It's, it's as you mentioned earlier, it's about an emotional context that you're trying to understand, not, not to copy images for the movie, no? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you also, if you see any of these pictures and then look at the movie, you feel like the movie is very different anyway. So, so um, you know, th this is just, for me, a starting point. This is something to look or, you know, like, like something to take on board when you go into it, but, but it's not... We're not looking for this. I, I sometimes see films where you see, okay, this is from that film, this is from that film. Yes, but um, that's not, I don't do that with stills. Isn't it exactly at that point where the difference in quality of cinematography comes out, if it's just a look that you're putting onto something, or you're actually trying to drive an emotion that again is creating an own look for a movie? You know, because it's your look, or it's your, your images you're creating, and it's not this kind of trying to copy different styles. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's just a base. So, and I get bored if it's a copy of something. Uh, and I also don't, I don't get, you know, I don't feel at home in it. So I don't, I, I can't do that. I could copy it, but, but then it becomes technical. Then you start looking for the wrong things. And then, um, no, this is just for me, the base layer, you, you know, like I say, it's a feeling or some, some, something you start with. Yeah, totally. That's not for lighting, that's more for a world, you know, how, I don't know. Not every picture means all the world. So <laughs> uh, we, I grabbed stuff which I, at the moment I thought, yeah, okay, we have a lot of family dinners, maybe, you know, that, that's kind of starkness, but then again, this didn't play anywhere. That's a good mood for the simplicity and for the color. Because um, w what happens now is a lot of places you go to, street lights are LED, you lose the color. You know, we have a lot of, um, we have some, in our film we have a, a couple of scenes where we have very orange lighting outside and, and it's, uh, we went with the sodium vapor, you know, all that disappears enough Sometimes that makes me sad. If you go like New York without sodium vapors, it becomes really like a very cool place or LA is the same. I grew up with a lot of um, warm light and, and uh, in, in night exteriors, in the films I saw. And, and uh, this is a, you know, mercury vapor light at night and, and I love the green I, and I love the strong color of this. Is that something you had to do in Tenderbar, like doing a historic piece that to re for the street lights because the colors are different outside? Did you have to do stuff on that? Oh yeah, we there w there's one walk and talk where we replaced all the street lights and we, because uh, there was only LED stuff around and we made it a uh, like um, it's a two minute walk and, and we basically had a block where we um, replaced all the street lights. It sounds a lot, but it's only 10 lights, and it's much cheaper than a condo. And as you can see, more beautiful, yeah, sometimes too. Yeah, I mean, if you look at that, that's also, uh, I did a lot of that, those colors in, in a film I did earlier. Like the American, we have a lot of this and orange light going on, and we have a lot of that color palette going. That's if you guys haven't seen it, American is amazing, what Martin did with the street colors and the lights there. So it's just... Think about the movie. It's actually only that color I still have in mind. Yeah, and uh, that was the first time I met George Clooney because he's in the film. And then, um, you know, then he asked me a few years later to do Catch-22 with him as a director. I love, I don't know, there's the softness, there's the natural light, and then it's beautiful. I love the colors. It's all, you know, and then the simplicity of it, but it's, and the emotion. Uh, it's just beautiful. How do you with uh, with blowing out windows? Is that something you decide for each movie if that's a good thing to look out or not? 
in in this film we did we had uh, we built the house interior everything is a set and we built the bar interior um, I quite often like blur, blurred out windows and and sometimes it's also a choice because you don't have the budget to put things out there but in this film I uh, it was a combination of both. We didn't have much budget for that. We were shooting during Corona, so to have an outside world with uh, maybe cars moving in the studio, it, it, it's a lot, and an extras and all of that. But uh, for the bar, I didn't want to see the outside that much because I thought it's much nicer because this is the world in which he grows up, and, and I think the boy forgets the outside. We forget the outside because it doesn't really matter that much. Similar in the house, so we were playing with different kind of curtains. We had a lot of bounce light, and sometimes we treated it a little bit like an exterior, uh, like, a, like a location where we had a lot of bounce lights around and then maybe a sunlight coming in. And then interior, we only used very little light. We had a couple of soft boxes as a fill, and then we only brought in one light for, for most of the scenes. Isn't that always the key to get a studio to look real, that it treated like a real set? It works for me, yeah? Mm, yeah. Unless you do something more stylized, then you do something else, yeah? yeah. This is more for colors and grade and tone and, you know, the warmth of this. And if you see the tender bar, there's a lot of warmth in the color and the grading and then um, texture, how dark, how deep are the blacks. And that's what I like about this one. Mm. It's so interesting sometimes with kind of a, it's not a front light, but close to it, that when the shadows kind of disappear, or colors start to pop more, no? where the composition becomes so much more about. Yeah, and, and uh, we're, s we're always taught that front light is not good and the natural reflexes always shoot everything backlit. But I think sometimes with faces, if you, as long as we have sh some shadow in the back, I don't mind. It's, you know, it's, it's like. And a lot of these pictures have that. They, they sometimes they front it, and, and people are in in hard sunlight, and so there's beauty to it. Where you go like, mm. we're shooting in winter, so the lower sun helps. It's you know, not winter to spring, so, so uh, the lower sun helps. Um, and and no, uh, you know, again, once again, if if you're open for something, you might be surprised. Uh, but I actually works nice here. People are different, but, but even with uh, humans, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a picture, front lit picture, but uh, yeah. it works. Yeah. It can work. That's also looking at the life and then, you know, the, a lot of the decorations and, and uh, there's so much stuff in the from the 70s and 80s which doesn't exist anymore. The cars, obviously those old cars look very beautiful. Uh, Always, but but again, you see how the, the you know how the colors work, how strong the reds are. It's a warm tone. I don't know. Uh, it's something I like. How does it feel like when an image like that? You can do a lot of searching, like the car in the back with the open. When you're framing images, is that something you look for that people can search, or is it always kind of you're focusing on on something? I'm just in the movie. This would have to actually stand kind of long, right, to to get that impression. I don't know. I think that that's a different thing because you look at this and then you look at the detail and richness. And this is also good to talk to to um, the production designer and say, hey, that if you put that broken car there, that could be an idea because people don't, you know, if you have period cars, you don't put a broken one. Maybe, uh, you know, in the back of the house at Tenderbar, there's a... Uh, rest of a car from the 40s and, and it's quite nice, it's a nice texture but it's also storytelling, you know they had better times before, they had used to have proper bit uh, nice cars and now all the cars around the house are shit basically It's gorgeous in contrast too no? how, how rich the blacks get and how the people come out Yeah and how small they are in frame and, and how focused the frame is and, and I like this Good example for front light, and, and you know, like like there's a lot of shadow run, and it makes it pop, and it gives a presence where you go, oh wow, you know, it could be nice to have something front lit. Yeah. This is also something. This, I mean, all of those are whatever Kodachrome, Ektachrome. I keep forgetting which does what, but it was. I think both of them were reversive stocks, and then 
the quality, you know, you don't have all the detail, but it it's renders color so beautiful. Not a front lid. But the composition is beautiful too, no? He's a master, he's one of the most famous American photographers and he records a time which, uh, you know, a lot of that doesn't exist anymore. So, and, and uh, also what, what I like or why I think this was a good reference for us is because he's not, um, you know, uh, basically our people in the film, it's about the bar and, and um, well, it's about the kid growing up in a bar. So it's blue color, uh, working class, Long Island, and, and he, he sometimes photographs rich people, but a lot he goes out to bars, cafes, street life, and, and street life from that time uh, without uh, it being too, uh, too clean or too cleaned up. And, and I, li you know, I like a lot of the detail. And sometimes also something like that could be interesting to talk to a, a Costume designer, does this, you know, do we want to use patterns? How could they be? Um, sometimes could be, there, there could be strong colors and maybe could, um, there's a moment where you think color could be great. Mm. It's just a strong image. <laughs> it's very simple, but uh, it is strong, yes. This is special, I don't know, this is, in the end, you know, we never found a moment to do anything like that. I love this picture. I wish we could have done more, but maybe that's more for a sad spy film. That's this more like Tinker Tailor or something. But yeah. um, our film was something different, it turned out, because also you don't know, when you, once you start the discussions, you don't always know uh, which direction it goes. So, so you go like, hmm, uh, th that could be something. And then, you know, you never come back to it. Do you look for, in lighting, do you look for simplicity? Because this just really lives off this one light, right? That's, that's coming in the room. Well, if you can, but, but um, on, on, this, on our film, we couldn't. So, so I like it, um, and, and it works sometimes, but, um, I, you know, I would not, this also, um, I don't know, it has to fit to the story, it has to fit to the style of acting, and it, it wouldn't have fit with ours. It would be too cold or too distant or too too staged. It's a beautiful thing when the sunlight only hits to a certain extent somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you tend to light for rooms? Like for such situations to happen like this, right? It really lives off. The light source has a lot yeah. to do with the position of the two. I like sometimes to throw in a light which is out of control. So all of these pictures, I don't think he used light. He just take, you know, maybe the one with the guy on the bed, there's a flashlight there or something. But most of the time, I don't think he uses light. So, so um, oh, he's very good at it. But I like when, uh, and, and there's beauty to it. So, so some, you know, it's nice to lose control because then you all of a sudden you take stilts and you go like, oh, this is amazing because the sun is so hard and it's so overexposed, but everything goes. But um, um, we all like that. We all respond to that. And, and if everything is always controlled and, and it's, if everything's always soft, it's nice to break it up sometimes and to lose control and see, oh, all of a sudden uh, this r corner of the room looks very interesting. What about if we do this? Uh, and then I like looking for that. I like when, when I'm on location doing that and in the studio as well because then it starts to add a realism. Do you tend to use like relighting to see if something accidental is happening that you can then play off with? Or how is it like when you say you throw a light and you have no control over how? Well, no, no it's, more li it's more like um, what about, um, you know, we all know there's a window, the perfect angles are like three quarter light there, but, but what about if you make it really hard and, and you know, you go right into the room and, and then all of a sudden the room looks very different. You know, it's this thing where we always on set and we, we switch off a light or, you know, you're like, oh, let's go to lunch. And all of a sudden there's, you know, you see one thing where you go like, it's that, you know, it, it looks amazing because you took away other stuff, or maybe somebody puts a light on a stand and switches on, and all of a sudden you go, oh, wow. 
I, I, I like those ones where you go like, ah, interesting. I wouldn't have done that ever because, but, but I like what it does and, and use that. Yeah. How was it for, for uh, somebody from Europe to go to the States and to, see, I mean, this, you look at this and you know this is America. Is there something that you were able to incorporate for yourself? Did you discover America differently, started to shoot over there? It's a different style to shoot, but, but I, I don't know. I don't care that much about how the different style. It's just everything looks so familiar because we've seen it in so many films. And I love um, how America looks on film or uh, in, in films. And, and um, so it, it, it's like something really familiar. And, and I, I, I like that because it's so very often... I don't know, sometimes you, you think about wha what makes that look, and then you come somewhere and you think, oh, they just put a camera in. <laughs> and it looks like that. Um, no, I like that. If you wanted to, we could, uh, uh, you had some pictures of, uh, of Tender Bar. Yeah, no? sure. Shall we look at those of and, and maybe see what, how that goes? Because I, I so that's, now that's the film we did then. So, so this is uh, frame grabs from the film. You see, we use some of the color, the, the blue Cadillac. What happens then is there were a lot of r strong reds and, and all that, but then, you know, you do your research and you get come across a blue Cadillac and that's really beautiful. So we use that car and not a red car. And, um, and this is basically the, the fear we had. And, and it, I think it's not too far from what we saw mm. in, in terms of tonality and contrast and texture. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Is that like, did you work on the sky? Or was this because these clouds here are just incredible, the way they're coming in? Was that I might have put a um, soft edge and D into it to not lose the detail in the sky. But um, everything is. Other than that, it's all natural. We did basically, in prep, um, all of a sudden we had a cold, well, it was very cold. It was f we prepped in February in Boston, and it's, we got snowed in, and then George was pushing to d for us to do a pre-shoot because we were not supposed to start shooting yet, but we did a pre-shoot to do all the snow scenes uh, in the film were basically improvised before we started shooting. It's really incredible when you see the images go together. Not if it's a, the, the feeling is really there, no? From I hope. Yeah. But yeah. It's like here too with this blown out window. If you just imagine this would not be blown out, there's just so much happening in the image. It really helps, no? Yeah, and I, that's a, in the house. I really like the blown out windows, and I, you know, uh, one other reason to do that was we tell years of story. So we would have had to put maybe trees with leaves, trees without leaves, or blue sky, night sky, whatever, curtain system, or you know, flats out there. And um, I, we had limited time, and I thought, I'm not that interested in the outside world anyway, so, so it's nice not to do that and, and uh, move quickly. And, and also, um, we, we could change between day and night in probably 15 minutes, half an hour uh, maximum. And, and that way, uh, for the actors liked it as well because there's a lot of talking in this film. There's a lot of uh, interaction between a lot of people. Um, we had a nine-year-old boy for half of the film. And um, it was nice. No, um, it helped for us to be fast. So that's the bar I mentioned earlier. And the before interior was the house. And those are all studio sets. It's beautiful how the lights here in the background, how it falls off and gives the kid more focus because it's not about the, like he's in the shade here, right? It's just kind of wrapping around. Is that things you look for? Because the first impression would be, say, oh, it has to be bright around the bar. Did he kind of let it dark there? I, I think the bar, I wanted to have a comfort. And I wanted also the daytimes to be uh, daylight seems to be darker in there and more moody and, and I like how um, I like to give it shape but I don't like I like to uh, you know still that it feels kind of it could be a late afternoon or something you know um, uh, this very much is based on how it could be in real life 
How much is it feel like with working with actors, bringing in gear into a scene like that? Do you try to keep all the technical part as far away as possible? Or when you punch in, do you kind of add things? No, because I've, I sometimes you do something when you punch in closer, but very often, I I think if the room is good, you know, you could punch in here and do a close up of the boy, and it would be beautiful. And then uh, you change the position, maybe you move some stuff. I, but on this, uh, we try to keep it really simple and and um, you know give them the space because they uh, um, you know we move the camera every now and then there but but um, uh, my part was I had the room we had I think f in pre-light we had sh very short pre-light by because my girlfriend came from another project onto that and but we still had four or five moods and then we had certain you know, movable stuff. We had uh, we used 24Ks um, for sunlight, and we mo moved that around. And then we had bounces around from the outside windows, and then a couple of softbox pre-hung. We only brought in one light for this, uh, I think. Mm. So when you created a lot, you had obviously Eggleston in mind, right? Because the way the colors are and the reds. Yeah. I think we went, um, in the end, in the grading, we went even a touch warmer than I would have liked. But um, that, that's because Josh had the feeling he wanted a really, uh, you know, a warm story, and uh, he wanted to embrace it. And, and what we, our lot was not quite as yellow as this. It was a tiny bit less, but um, a bit closer to the eggs and stuff. But I'm happy with this. So, and and it, uh, it's always, you know, I think it's a group thing. So, so even the grading, it's, um, we're all working together and we ended here. Yeah, this is a frame, the front wheel comes into shot and then the camera lifts up to here and we see, that's the first time we see the father of the boy appearing in picture. And that's his introduction. We see the car coming into shot. We hear somebody getting out. We see him crossing. The focus always stays on the front wheel because he's a uh, radio talk show host, and 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 he lets down the kids so often in the film. And this is the first time we meet him. So until he comes into the door, we never see him. This is a location, or is that studio? Studio. This is an example from. Yeah, you know, you throw in a hard light and then the h light hitting the seat is a bit too much, but it's, it's real, all of a sudden it's something real and then you look what happens to the room and then uh, we had a couple of, I don't know, a couple of 24Ks or 10Ks coming in from that side. Uh, you know, that's just, all that is studio, yeah. Just as a, uh, to get a visual feeling for it, so there's a, obviously there's a window here, the light com is coming in. Yes. Then you've got 24 k's, whatever, in the back, come pushing in through the window. Did he have some kind of, a, I don't know, soft drops or something in the back? Or did he do like just the ceiling? Did he recreate the sky? How, how was, just basically, how did the world look outside of that window? Pretty much like that. That all strongly blown out. We, we, uh, we ended up putting one dead tree on that side. And it was like, um, I don't know. Uh, there we could have had a bit more, but, but in the end I didn't mind. I, I, um, we tested what curtains we would put on because the light goes through the curtains um, and that gives you a color on skin and, and everything, you know, everything in the room. And, and um, so, so I test, we, we had a few different layers um, until we landed there. And outside, like it was like just bouncing as well. There was uh, the adding into this because yeah, we had a lot of um, um, eight by uh, twelve by twenties or uh, twelve by twelves or twenty by twenties, and we were bouncing into them. And that was also um, there was an earlier stage when we had um, a lighting plan, and we had a tons of sky panels hanging around in that lighting plan to do. That would have been a nicer version and then it would have been more flexible and fast because uh, obviously you can change color, temperature and everything, but we didn't have that. We couldn't afford it, to be honest. Um, and, and then we went pretty simple and old school. We had tons of bounces around. Like in the 60s. 
in the 60s, I'm not sure if they would have bounced that much. Oh, that's true. That was too early, yeah. Yeah. Then it would have become more stagey. Yeah. Maybe. That's true. That's a nice example for color, where we add in the practicals color. And, and w um, one of the things we talked about with production design, I wanted the bar and then the walls to be shiny here. So, mm. so everything comes so much uh, alive if that happens. Mm. And then I remember w seeing a lot of American films where the walls were shiny. And I was like, I'm so jealous about that because it makes it so easy. You put one light there and the whole wall lives. But, but um, I like that. Yeah. Again, advertisement. Shooting COVID is fun, no? During COVID, it's the masks. <laughs> well, you know, I'm actually thankful that we were able to do this film with COVID, but it, it literally is uh, tough, as, as you can see. I, I remember I was at one of the last days of the shoot. I sat at lunch, you know, on a bench two, me, uh, two meters away uh, from my uh, grip dolly grip and uh, that was the first time I saw him without a mask I never had seen his face because it's like m a lot of that w was uh, always we were always around in my ma uh, running around in mass we had one location our um, kid uh, grows up mother wants him to be a, a lawyer and and he becomes uh, he wants to be a writer and so he gets a job at the New York Times, and we had an um, office location. Uh, I don't know which floor that was, third floor, fifth floor. Um, but the road was quite steep outside, so we couldn't put condos. Um, and we were thinking of putting lights on the other side of the house and that uh, on the house on the other side of the road, and that didn't all, all of that didn't work and was not practical. And also probably not pretty safe. And um, so my um, gaffer friends uh, and I, we discussed, and he figured out that if we would take out the windows up uh, one floor above and put these reflectors out there and, and have the lights on the street, we could bounce into them. So, so And that's the setup we had. Basically, we had up top, we had all the reflectors, and they put them out on a... On a on a rigging system that, so that they could wheel them out and in. And um, we had all the lights at the bottom and um, that was the best way we could find to light the scene. And it was the only possible way and it was actually quite quite beautiful, effective. You s so you see there's this practical lights and then you see on these guys in the foreground there's a soft sunlight coming in and we have some other scenes in the film where you look right towards the windows and you have the soft light coming in and you have the fluorescent light. It was a beautiful combination. I really like that. Here you see this is the floor above. This is the rigging they did. It's all on wheels. So they could pull it out, pull it in, and that's the lights. And we, I think we had 10 or 12 over the uh, length of the building. To be honest, I've not used your reflectors very much because I, I only lately came aware and then um, now some of the ask for them and if people have them uh, it's fine but uh, that was I, I really loved what they were doing the quality of light was beautiful thanks so much thanks so much for sharing this you're welcome so we're getting to the ends of it any questions to hand over uh, you go for such a natural look like on a tender bar uh, how do you work with eyelids Additionally, add more highlights, um, or do you do not do that? You mean highlights or eyelights? Mm, well, I f I, uh, on that one particularly, we used uh, um, the DMG, uh, the, the what's it called, the Lumiere, uh, and we had that through a big f diffusion, and uh, I used that quite a bit, you know, like like. The light I said we would bring in, that what was usually a uh, lumiere and then different shapes of that, and then through that big cloth. Um, and no, no more than that. I didn't use uh, whatever, tiny something. I love how that falls, how that modulates, and um, 
how it doesn't force the actor to be here rather than here. Do you anyway when you when you do highlights, that's something you just let it naturally fall if you have something, or do you go in and do something for the eyes if you see it's not sparkling? I like I like to do that with a softer source or with a bounce, not so much with a light. Yeah. Unless there's a good reason for that, but yeah. yeah. It's also, it depends a lot. I always feel that if the eye light's been brought in afterwards, you lose the color of the eye sometimes because just this bright thing there looks much more beautiful. It fits in with the room, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, if, if, you, if the light doesn't integrate with what you've been doing, um, then it puts you out, or there must be a good reason. I don't know. There might be a reason, if, you know, somebody using a torch or something could be that. Yeah. Um, but. No. I have a question. In the beginning, you said where this uh, boy was lying on the floor, it was a reference you had. And you also said that this would be a nice a black and white uh, picture. Is this, a, uh, is this something you, when you create your uh, pictures, that you think that uh, this would also be a nice black and white picture? Or is it. No, I've, I've done couple of black and white things, you know, in commercials, music videos, and, and uh, I did a black and white film. I don't think that way. I mean, I was looking at it because it was so reduced. It's, yes, there's a green wash, but, but the green wash didn't mean much to me. So, so I thought in terms of contrast and how it falls off, but I don't think, oh, this could be great in black and white. Quite often it's the, I mean, the, the New York Times stuff could be great in black and white. Uh, the the interior of the house may be a bit too muddy sometimes, but uh, um, I I it's not a I don't know it's not a criteria. I wouldn't know what to gain from that. Cool. So, so if that's all from the audience, I thank you for coming. Yes. Thank you.